So that's the kind of brief, uh, big picture overview. And uh, what I thought I would do as a way of kind of a topics review is maybe model um, what I think you should do as you are reviewing because you don't have that much time. Um, you, I'm sure you're taking other classes too. You have other work and family obligations. So, um, so you know, it's not reasonable to expect you to be able to basically reread the textbook. That, uh, I'm pretty sure you won't have time for that. But here is uh, something that you can do. You can look at the chapter objectives listed on the chapter overview page in Canvas modules. And as you are looking at those chapter objectives, you will see um, it'll be a way to spot what you might have forgotten. And you know, hopefully there are, aren't that many of them. Uh, the more there are, the more time it will take for you to review. So, but this would be a starting place. Look at the chapter objectives. If we are finding that, yeah, you remember um, all those objectives make sense. It feels like you have achieved them. You recall things, then great. Uh, that's what we are looking for. And, you know, in terms of learning and memory, there's uh, different levels of how well you remember things. There's a level of memory and understanding where um, um, you can basically recall things. If I were to ask you, what are the three, what were the three most important things in this class, then you can name all three. Then that's the kind of the highest level of uh, memory and recall and I guess uh, mastery of the subject that you've been learning. And, you know, I would love for everyone to have that level of understanding, but um, that kind of thing is kind of hard to test for um, other than in the oral exam, which would be the option B final exam if I, uh, if anyone was doing that. And, um, so that's not really what to look for. Uh, what is to look for is kind of a recognition level of uh, memory recall and understanding. As in, um, someone asks you, uh, is this uh, Newton's one of Newton's laws? And, you know, say, um, I don't know. Um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to think of a fake Newton's law. Maybe something like, oh, the um, the, if someone were to ask you, the statement, the total momentum of, a, uh, of a, an isolated system is conserved, is this one of Newton's laws? Then I hope you can kind of uh, think through what Newton's laws of motion was and realize that none of those laws directly refer to momentum and say, oh, yeah, it wasn't any one of the Newton's laws. That's the kind of level of testing that I am able to do with the multiple choice portion of the exam. And really all you have to do to, prep, do to prepare for that multiple choice portion of the exam is develop that uh, level of uh, recognition type of um, understanding and memory. So, so let me just uh, model this. Um, so this is what it would look like. So here's the Canvas page, um, so or, or my Canvas site, chapter, uh, Physics 10. And um, what I'm suggesting there is as simple as finding these 15 pages. So when you look under the modules, you will see these chapter overview pages in what? In, in week one, here's overview of chapter one and you look at it. And so these overview pages are built in this way. Uh, I copy, I copy the chapter objective from the textbook for under each section. So when I actually go to the section 1.1, at the very top here, it'll say under summary, uh, this as the, the section objectives and um, and by the way, because this is textbook that I put together, I did review every one of these objectives. Um, so as you are, I mean, you can do this in the textbook too. You can uh, just go through section by section 
And in each section, kind of look at the sum summary here and see if that makes sense. Um, and, and, you know, there's like, not quite 100, but close to 100 uh, pages you can go through this way. Or if you want it to be a little bit quicker, involve not quite as many clicks, you can use the ch chapter overview pages. So you look at these statements that, um, you know, after the sections, that should be able to explain the difference between a model and a theory. And if you feel like you can, then great. Um, move on. <laughs> uh, now, if you feel like you've forgotten it, then usually as you look at the week's module, you might see something that uh, jogs your memory or helps you recall that distinction between model and the theory. And usually a lot of them will be under the lectures uh, heading. That's uh, how I think I collected the lecture materials this semester. Um, so you know, there's a recorded video on uh, models, theories, and laws. So, so yeah, um, now chapter one is a bit of an introductory chapter. You should know the, the common prefixes in the SI units so that where there's a number calculation question and there's some prefix, I don't know, mega, giga, and they expect you to be able to put in the, um, put in the power of 10, then you should be able to, uh, you should be able to do that. So, um, yeah, uh, so there's that. Um, chap the meat of the content for this class starts out with the chapter two. So take a look at overview of chapter two, and this is what you see. You see all these sections and all these um, um, objectives. That uh, and I hope it doesn't take you that long to look over these objectives. That maybe it takes you five, ten minutes to read each statement carefully and judge it for yourself uh, if you understood what it was trying to get at or not. So um, 2.1 displacement, it says, define position, displacement, distance, and distance traveled. And if, uh, as you're reading it, if uh, all this sounds very mysterious, like isn't displacement the same thing as distance? And what's the distinction with the distance traveled? That's a hint that you should look at the uh, chapter section. So. And you know you can also use the search function, either your in-browser search function that you can get it through the menu, uh, find. And uh, what am I looking for? Uh, distance traveled, distance traveled. Then, um, then you know you can see. Oh, all oh, oh, right. That's the distinction between distance traveled and magnitude of displacement. Um, or if you have to get at um, uh, you can also do this. You can, so this kind of in browser search will only search the current module. You can also search the book for distance traveled and that will uh, give you some results. Some of which may uh, not be relevant at all. Like the, uh, well, content in chapter one may be relevant. And uh, uh, it's text, it says something about apply to sound the wave decreases with the distance from its source. And, um, yeah, anyways, so, so yeah, you should spend uh, five to 10 minutes looking over each of these objectives, you know, um, reading it to yourself and um, convincing yourself that you achieve that objective. That when it says calculate displacement and distance given in each position, final position, the path between the two that you feel like, oh, I have done this before, I know how to do it, I can move on. Now, if you feel like uh, this was never covered, that's an excellent reason to actually go to the section and try to look for, um, was it covered? So, um, okay, let's keep going. And uh, some of the formulas that you had to use uh, in previous exams are under falling objects um, and possibly projectile motion. Um, Yeah, and uh, centripetal acceleration is an important one to remember because sometimes it, uh, I would ask you 
questions that um, that are conceptual questions, and I think of them as conceptual questions. But uh, sometimes there are cases where people don't remember that centripetal acceleration is given by speed squared over the radius of curvature. So, um, so yeah, and uh, it's just very important to distinguish a centripetal force from um, or centripetal acceleration from, you know, uh, let me actually cover this particular uh, particular idea in the next chapter overview, because it has to do with the role of centripetal acceleration. And really what's uh, important uh, when we are talking about kinematics, uh, what's important here is that objects moving in circle or a portion of a circle uh, are accelerating, as in their velocity is changing. Uh, their velocity is changing. So, and, um, and the tricky thing is, uh, sometimes you have this con uh, situation. Um, so even when speed is constant, as in even when the magnitude of uh, a velocity is constant, it's the change in direction of velocity that uh, that's associated with the centripetal acceleration. Um, all right, um, so let's keep going. So that's chapter two overview. Um, yes. um, and then there's the chapter three overview, uh, talk about forces. And I hope as you look through this uh, overview that, um, that it uh, makes you proud of how much you've learned, how much you are able to achieve this master that um, if before you didn't know what mass and inertia meant, that now after having gone through this course, that you know what's meant by inertia beyond the common English uh, definition of inertia where it's, uh, you know, we talk about inertia of a large organization where it's uh, difficult to get large organizations moving. But in physics, inertia takes a very specific type of meaning that uh, is related to uh, relate to how is, let's see, uh, how much a given mass accelerates given some same amount of force. And when a mass accelerates easily, it has a small inertia. When a mass um, accelerates only with the difficulty, it has very large inertia. So, um, so, you know, I'm hoping that as you are looking through these objectives that it makes sense. Now, it says, uh, for example, 3.3 says, apply Newton's second law to determine the weight of an object. And uh, maybe you are blanking out on what Newton's second law is. And if you are, that is the entire reason why I'm asking you to do a review for the final exam because after having identified that you might not be remembering what Newton's second law is, then you can go into the section uh, and read it through it, skim it, or just to, uh, to control F for second law for second, or second for second law. And um, you get to this section where you get, it talks about to obtain an equation for Newton's second law, we first write the relationship of acceleration and net external force as the proportionality like this, and, oh, excuse me. And then it goes into how the acceleration is uh, inversely proportional to the mass. Um, and here's the mathematical form of Newton's second law, which, um, uh, I, which I hope you understand by now, but if not, you know, this uh, review during the final, so, week is really your chance to uh, revisit the things that you might have found confusing the first time around and see that you, uh, you understand more and better. 
So uh, the rest of the chapter continues with uh, uh, Newton's laws and types of force, uh, normal force, tension, spring force. Um, um, yeah, oh, and here's the uh, discussion about centripetal force. The, um, so the learning objective here is to explain the role of centripetal force in a uniform circular motion. So when something is undergoing uniform circular motion, as in going in circles, but at a constant speed, that it, there is a still centripetal force acting on it. And this centripetal force, um, um, so, so this is how I like to describe centripetal force. The way I like to describe it is it's a type of net force. As in, there is no particular force that we single out as uh, this is the, what we call centripetal force. And there isn't anything like that. Instead, whenever you are talking about centripetal force, you are talking about the net force. What is the sum of all the forces? Um, so the thing that make, distinguishes the centripetal force from other types of force, like uh, friction and uh, spring force and tension force and normal force that you saw before is those are distinct forces that you can kind of point to. Um, so in case of tension force, there's some string attached to it and the string is applying tension force, you can say that. And um, so that's uh, how you identify individual forces. Someone says there's a friction force on this object as it's moving, then you look for, okay, then what other object is exerting that friction force. Centripetal force, it's not a separate force on its own. It is a net force. It's just, uh, you take all the forces and just uh, add them up together. That, uh, that'll give you the centripetal force. And what makes a centripetal force distinct from what we call just a regular net force is that this force has uh, particular properties. One, it's always perpendicular to the direction of travel. If uh, there's a ball uh, moving upward here, and we say there's centripetal force on it, then we immediately know that the direction of force is perpendicular to the ball, um, one way or the other. And, oh yeah, so that's the, there's the direction of centripetal force. And it turns out with the centripetal force, you can tie the magnitude of the force to other properties of the ball, like uh, the ball is moving at speed V, uh, tracing out a circle of radius R then we can kind of immediately write down centripetal force is mass times the speed squared over R. So, um, so that's centripetal force. All right, I think I gotta go a little bit more quicker. Um, so uh, now when you are reviewing these topics, I hope you set aside more time that you set aside at least 10 minutes or so going through each overview. Uh, for me, let me just skim through the rest of the overview pages. There's the one on the uh, work and energy in chapter four. Once again, it, it lists each section. So what you should be spending time on is, you should be looking at, um, let's say you got this far. Um, the section objective says, explain gravitational potential energy in terms of work done against gravity. And uh, if you're not sure, wait, uh, how was gravitational potential energy defined or derived? Then this is where you would follow the chapter section link and see how, I think here it does try to describe you. Uh, it does talk about work done against the gravity and Anyways, um, so to, to check out the uh, section uh, that contains objectives that you find, uh, that, that you find you don't quite remember enough of. Um, so yeah, each of, 
each of the chapters have these pages, uh, chap chapter overview pages, and I, I think that's a single best uh, systematic way to check what topics you remember, and hopefully you feel good about yourself for remembering, and what topics you might have forgotten. So let's say you are kind of forgetting what inelastic and, well, it talks about yeah, what inelastic and elastic meant, then this is the, um, this is the moment where you go back to the sections and uh, look at their definition of elastic and their definition of inelastic. Um, that's five. Oh, I did oscillations of waves first um, and then rotation. Well, um, so here's chapter six talking about rotations and waves. Um, and uh, be sure to go through each one of these. This was covered in your exam too. But uh, what I'd say is, um, so, so this is what you should do as a, a kind of way of review. Um, because there will likely be multiple choice questions that can easily involve some of these topics. So as you're reading through here, you look at 6.5, wave interference, and maybe you feel like you understand the wave interference, but then as you're going to objectives, it says distinguish between constructive interference and destructive interference. And you ask yourself, do you know what that means? Like how would the destructive interference be distinguished from constructive interference? And if you feel like you can do that, um, as it explained how wave superposition leads to uh, some cases where two waves cancel each other out. And um, so if you remember all that, then great, uh, move on. But if you feel like uh, where when you said the wave interference, you felt like you understood it, but as it gets into more detail, you can quite recall what specific detail it's referring to, then that's when you go into the section and make sure that you, um, um, make sure that what that objective says makes sense. So you search for constructive and uh, there's the description of constructive interference and hopefully reading this description makes sense. So, all right, uh, I don't know if there's a, value in me going over every one of these overview pages, especially if I'm falling asleep. <laughs> so uh, each at the beginning of each chapter, uh, we have them. Let me just uh, look at it to make sure they exist every chapter, you know, overview of chapter seven, um, overview of chapter eight. Oh, I forgot about fluids entirely when I did uh, this review. Well, um, that's the reason, I mean, <laughs> I hope this is a good illustration of why you should do this review, because even I'm forgetting <laughs> that we covered the fluids. So if you're just uh, trying to recall everything, it's very easy to forget. Um, you've seen me do that. This was me before I was uh, starting to uh, feel asleep. <laughs> so, so that's the real value in, uh, going over each one of these overview pages. It'll, um, it'll remind you of things that you might have forgotten. And, you know, um, it's one thing if uh, once someone guides you to think about pressure due to the weight of fluid, then you can remember the rest. You can remember the formula. You can remember how that connects to other things like Archimedes principle, then great. Um, but if uh, you're not getting them, that, that, that's your hint that you should go into this section and uh, spend a little more time. So, okay, so chapter eight, <laughs> that wraps up unit two mechanics. And okay, good, unit three, there's thermal physics, chapter nine, look at the overview. There's uh, chapter 10, once again, look at the overview. And there's chapter um, 11, magnetism, look at the overview and chapter 12, light. And so again, look at the overview. So what we covered through here, chapter 12 is uh, three quarters of the course. And anyways, uh, so you should uh, continue to look through 
chapter overview pages uh, to remind you of um, what you might have forgotten since you took the midterm exam. And from that sense, really, chapters 13, 14, 15 are the ones that you need a uh, list to review on because you just cover that in your midterm exam. And that's frankly the biggest reason why I deliberately have the final exam depend less on these last th three chapters of your textbook because I, um, because I, I feel like that uh, um, those are the materials that you don't really need to review. And um, yeah, so, so yeah, uh, look at the look at the chapter overview. That might take you a good day to kind of uh, uh, one verify that you haven't forgotten big chunks of the uh, semester, like an entire chapter on fluid mechanics, <laughs> and two that um, for the the topics that you remember covering, that um, that each of the objectives gives you enough of a trigger to remember the things that you might need to remember for the multiple choice questions or the essay questions. Now for the essay questions in particular, I would uh, encourage you to look at the essay assignment again. Um, I, you know, I get questions from people all the time. How do I prepare for the exam? And for the multiple choice section, I tell you to do what I'll be demonstrating shortly. I, you know, go through a practice exam. That's really how you should prepare for the exam. And, um, and unfortunately, the practice exam will only help you prepare for the multiple choice portion of the exam because those are practice multiple choice questions. And those are the questions that I'll put on your exam or on, on your multiple choice portion of the exam. For the essay portion of the exam, um, I can quite give you extensive collection of problems. One, because I don't have that many, I don't want to give them all away. And so what I keep telling people to do to prepare for the essay portion of the exam is to say, uh, look at the essay assignments. So let's say you uh, remember struggling with uh, unit three, the uh, classical physics. Then now is a good time to kind of go back and look at what the, look at the essay assignment questions and rewatch the videos if you need to rewatch any of them. And the, and the second thing, this is super important, you should look at the answers. So there's in the peer grading assignment is where the answers to these four essay questions are. You should go into it. You should actually take a look at and make sure that you understand, like when you that's uh, how is boiling or cooling process that everything that it says here makes a sense. If any of them don't, then um, I guess I don't make it easy for you to refer to the uh, textbook chapters from the SL assignment answers, but um, you kind of have a sense of in what section this should have been. It should have been thermal physics and um, and then you might have to look at the table of contents to see where within thermal physics this might be. Um, so yeah, that those are like uh, uh, so you. Know, so so after looking over the chapter overviews, what I would recommend that you uh, devote your time to is to look at essay assignment because that'll. Um, that'll give you a firm grounding for the, the essay questions on the exam also. Um, all right, uh, so that's, uh, let's see, we'll overview the chapter objectives. And I think that's kind of uh, everything I want you to go over in terms of how you should be preparing and how, um, yeah, how you should be preparing for your final exam. 